In the beginning, there was a big bang. Except there wasn't. Theory is a theory that tells us everything from the first fraction of a second to present day. But that picture does not tell us what was there before. That's the fundamental mystery of cosmology. Why was it like that? These are all ideas which are hugely speculative. Based on a lot more interpretations and metaphysical assumptions than is commonly supposed. That's the weak point of conventional cosmology. And then we take those theories and just import them to the Big Bang, where we see that they just fit all the observations perfectly there as well. I'm going to start at the beginning. Um, and as you all know, in the beginning, there was a Big Bang. Except there wasn't. This is not what the beginning of the universe looked like. There was no bang in the Big Bang Theory. There's no explosion in the Big Bang Theory. In fact, um, and this, this may come as a bit of a surprise, the Big Bang Theory has absolutely nothing to say about the question of how the universe started. What it does describe is what the universe looked like when it was very much younger. And the entire theory is based on, on an extremely simple premise. It's, it's the following. We look out in the universe around us, and we see all the stars and the galaxies, and all of those galaxies are moving further away. So tomorrow, they're going to be further away from each other than they are today. The Big Bang Theory really just winds the clock back and makes the very obvious observation that if you go back into the past, everything's closer together. So the Big Bang Theory takes that and just pushes it to the most extreme limit imaginable. It, it suggests the following. Um, as uh, you squeeze things closer together, they get hotter. And the Big Bang Theory says that if you take that to the limit, there was a time in the very distant past, it's about 14 billion years ago, when there were no stars, there were no galaxies, there were no planets. Instead, the entire universe was filled with a fireball. This is the entire universe. This is the, the history of history itself. That This uh, sort of you know, white blurry bit here is what we would colloquially call the Big Bang. For the first period of the universe, there was a fireball which filled the universe. This is this kind of mottled green and blue uh, color in the diagram here. But at some point, of course, the, the, the fireball cooled at around 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And then when it cooled, there was a bunch of stuff, more or less just hydrogen atoms. But very slowly, over a long period of time, uh, the hydrogen started to gather and clump together. It did this just because of gravity. And as they got bigger, the pressure inside the clump would get larger and larger. After about 500 million years, the pressure inside the clumps got so large that the hydrogen ignited. This was the birth of the very first stars. There are stars being born, there are stars dying. When they die, they have these wonderful supernova explosions. They spew out all these heavy elements that they've created into the void. It forms new stars, it forms galaxies, it forms planets. And the reason we know it's true is because we can see it. So this is the photograph of the fireball that filled the Big Bang in the early universe. It's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. There are bits in the fireball that are, that are hot, they're red, and there are bits in the fireball that are, that are cold, they're blue. And there's information in these flickers. 380,000 years after the Big Bang, at this time, the fireball is roughly 100,000 degrees centigrade. At 100,000 degrees centigrade, atoms melt. The electrons just can't cling on anymore. So they get stripped away from the nucleus of the atom. So at this temperature, what you have is a gas, not of atoms, but a gas of the nuclei, and then electrons which are, which are flying around. It's usually called a plasma rather than a gas. So that, that's what's going on. So that's 380,000 years, and now we wind the clock back. And as we go backwards in time, things get hotter, until you reach a temperature, you get this right, of 10,000 million Celsius. Okay, that's 10 to the 10 degrees. Um, it takes a long time for things to get that hot, long time going backwards. Um, you reach this temperature only when you get to one hundredth of a second after the Big Bang itself. Okay? But one hundredth of a second after the Big Bang, you hit this temperature. At this temperature, nuclei melt. That means that the nuclei contain protons and neutrons, but when you hit this temperature, they fall apart into just protons and neutrons. They, they, they can't stick together anymore. Okay? That's one hundredth of a second after the Big Bang. Then we go further back in time until we reach one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. One millionth of a second after the Big Bang, the temperature is 10 to the 13 
degrees, and now the protons and neutrons melt. When you get to a millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, the Higgs boson melts. So at these temperatures, the Higgs boson stops giving mass to everything else, and all the other particles that are floating around suddenly become really kind of light and breezy, and they, they fly around. This is the stuff that we're sure happened, that we, ju we just know about. And I'd, I'd like to explain why. Um, it's because all the things that I've listed here, to one degree or another, we can recreate here on Earth. We can uh, develop theories which work, work perfectly for these situations, and then we take those theories and just import them to the Big Bang, where we see that they just fit all the observations perfectly there as well. We know exactly what the universe was doing one minute after the very beginning of the Big Bang. That first minute is a little bit up for grab. Might the Big Bang theory be mistaken? Sean, would you like to, to start? Right. So to answer that, we first have to say what we mean by the Big Bang Theory, because this phrase is meant in two very different contexts, right? We all know the universe is expanding, so if you run the clock backwards, if you run the film uh, to the past, 14 billion years ago, it was in a hot, dense state, and we have something called the Big Bang Model of Cosmology, which is simply the statement that 14 billion years ago, the universe was in a hot, dense state. It expanded and cooled and went from being very smooth to relatively lumpy, which it is right now with all these stars and galaxies and so forth. That's the Big Bang model. It is true. There's no <laughs> point in doubting the Big Bang model, okay? We don't let people up here on stage if they doubt that part of the Big Bang model. <laughs> but if you take seriously general relativity and you say, well, what happened at the very beginning? What happens if... So we, we know exactly what the universe was doing one minute after the very beginning of the Big Bang, okay? From one minute after to 14 billion years after, we understand. That first minute is a little bit up for grabs. So uh, classical general relativity, the theory that Einstein gave us for space and time would say, according to Roger and Stephen Hawking, that at that moment, t equals zero at the very beginning, there was a singularity but there's also this thing called quantum mechanics, which gets in the way, which is not part of general relativity. So if you want to say the Big Bang event, the Big Bang moment, the beginning of everything, we don't know whether that is right or not. We have room as theoretical physicists and cosmologists to invent new scenarios and debate over which is right, which is wrong. And so that's where our disagreement comes in. Um, I'm pretty agnostic, to be honest, about whether or not that moment, because it's a moment in time, the Big Bang, not a place in space. It's not an explosion in a pre-existing space. It's the beginning of everything. It's the moment before which there were no other moments. And that's the model. And the question is, is that model right? So I, I have two favorite theories, and neither one of them is Roger's favorite theory. So that <laughs> gives us something to talk about. Um, the, the one theory that I think is, is very at least on the table, is plausible, is yes, that is the beginning of the universe, and it's because time and space themselves are not fundamental. That when you get deep into the guts of quantum mechanics, you realize that all the stuff around us, the tables, the chairs, space itself, time itself, are emergent, approximate phenomena. They're like talking about the air as a fluid with a temperature and a pressure rather than talking about the molecules. Maybe even time is just a good approximation, and it started 14 billion years ago. That's one possibility that I think is very plausible. The other, if time is truly fundamental, if time is real and there and, and inextricable from the fundamental equations, then I think it's very likely that the Big Bang was not the beginning in that case. But I also think that, as Roger has <coughs> emphasized better than anyone, there's something very profound about the nature of time in our observable universe. Namely, that it has a direction, right? That the past is different from the future. And if we can get into this, I hope, the reason why the past is different from the future in your everyday life, the reason why you remember yesterday and not tomorrow, is ultimately because of what conditions were like at the Big Bang. That's what set up the arrow of time, and that's the fundamental mystery of cosmology. Why was it like that? So my favorite view of that is that there is a much larger universe that we don't see, that our little universe is a tiny little part of the whole picture, and the whole picture is actually symmetric, that there are people <laughs> in our past who think that we are in their past, that time runs in the opposite direction for them as it does for us. This is not by any means 
set in stone. We don't know it for sure, but this, these are the kinds of scenarios that we're talking about as professional cosmologists to understand why the universe that we do live in looks the way it does. We eventually run into a phase of the universe where all the matter was plasma. Anything before that is just speculation. We have very good evidence that the universe is expanding. I think there's pretty much no one in the scientific community who would doubt that. And it follows from this that if we try to run the evolution of the universe back in time, the universe must have been smaller, it must have been denser. Uh, and with that, uh, we eventually run into a phase of the universe where all the matter was uh, just one hot plasma with fluctuations in it. And I think up to this point, uh, we're, we're on pretty safe ground. Um, yes, we did have to introduce some new things like dark matter and dark energy to actually make this uh, time evolution fit, fit with the observations. Uh, but having said that, it works just fine. Now, if we try to go further beyond that, uh, it gets much more complicated because there's, um, if we go back in time, we go to higher and higher energy scales. And at some point, they get higher than the energy scales that we have been able to test so far. Um, the highest energies that we have tested were probed at the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, anything before that is just speculation. So you can continue to push the theories to higher and higher energies, uh, but really we, we don't know if that's actually what's going on. And now there are lots of um, uh, theoretical physicists who nevertheless have come up with theories for that. Um, so all this matter um, is supposed to be um, created by some other field, uh, the inflaton field. There is supposed to be a, a phase of exponential expansion that's called inflation, um, which is also supposed to be caused by that field. And ultimately, the universe supposedly came out of some quantum fluctuation and so on. And so these are all ideas which are hugely speculative. Uh, and I personally think the evidence is not very good for that. Um, there is some evidence that one can discuss. And then beyond this, there is this question like, uh, where did it all come from? The core, I think it rests on a lot of faith that there actually are universal mathematical laws that hold true far beyond what's possible to test. My philosophical work is on the limits of scientific knowledge. And so for me, why I got interested in cosmology is because I think this is the science where the lines between metaphysics and physics or faith and knowledge are the most obviously blurred. And this calls for some, some questioning. Um, and the Big Bang Theory is really based on a lot more interpretations and metaphysical assumptions than is commonly supposed. Uh, and at the core, I think it rests on a lot of faith that there actually are universal mathematical laws that hold true far beyond what's possible to test. And so just to put this very briefly in perspective, we know already with reasonable confidence from observation and testing that general relativity works for about 0.1% of the universe according to Big Bang theory. So the Big Bang model is essentially an extension of Einstein's general relativity into the remaining 99.9% .9 of the theoretical universe. And Although there are ways in which we can measure using measuring methods to get far beyond this and to probe beyond the one point or 0.1 percent, the further out we go, the more model dependent we also become, and it becomes more and more difficult to calculate things with precision. And this is why you see so many different discrepancies pop up in uh, in the last years when it comes to measurements. So. Um, all of this to say is I think that there are lots of problems with the model that are not generally acknowledged and that makes it worth asking the question. Uh, the question for the Big Bang itself is, from my point of view, obviously beyond what we could say anything about empirically. Any alternative to the Big Bang has a very high evidentiary bar to clear. If we frame the Big Bang as the fact that the universe started in a hot, dense state roughly 14 billion years ago, I think the evidence is very, very strong for that premise. And everything I'm about to say does not depend on the nature of dark energy or dark matter. Those absolutely affect the expansion history, but they don't affect what I'm going to say as evidence for the Big Bang itself. Um, and I agree, I'm an observer, so I think cosmology should be empirical, driven by observations, and the basic observation is redshift which is one of the pu few pure observables in cosmology. So we have the recession velocity of galaxies, proportional to distance, known for a century, 
and most obviously interpreted as a 3D uniform expansion with no center. So Copernican principle holds. In the context of general relativity, the Hubble law represents expanding space-time. This is an exercise we give our advanced undergraduates. The dynamical evolution of the universe is part of the theory. It's predicted. And once you trace the expansion backwards, you infer that there should be relic radiation left over from the dense hot state. You, it was predicted and a rough temperature assigned in the 1940s and less than 20 years later, accidentally observed by radio astronomers. It's almost perfectly smooth or isotropic and it's almost perfectly thermal with a temperature just under three degrees Kelvin. A big check mark on the whole idea. And this radiation fits the idea of the universe becoming transparent as stable atoms form when it was about a thousand times hotter and a thousand times smaller than it is now. I'll also point to a large pile of evidence that's, that's kind of messy, but it's a lot of astrophysics about cosmic evolution. The fact that the evolution of galaxies and active galaxies and the radiation of the universe and the regions between the galaxies, there's many observations that point to evolution consistent and concordant with our early hot dense state. That's a, that's a lot of astrophysics in there. And then the light element abundances are a primary piece of evidence for the Big Bang. Stars in the universe over our cosmic history could not have created a quarter of the universe by mass in helium. The Big Bang theory accounts for that. And then in a completely different observational realm, the isotope of uh, hydrogen, deuterium, which is essentially primordial intergalactic gas, one part in 10 to the five in abundance, also matches perfectly with the Big Bang model with no free parameters basically, because the only free parameter originally was the baryon to photon ratio, which has been measured by microwave observations. So I guess to finish, I would say that any alternative to the Big Bang, as I framed it, um, has a very high evidentiary bar to clear. And it's not true that other theories haven't been looked at. Tired light has been looked at and ruled out. And so, and there are cyclic models, obviously, that can finesse a Big Bang. But in the terms of the basic idea, again, independent of dark matter and dark energy and their nature, I think it hangs together very well. There's consistency checks on the age from the age of individual stars. So independent of expansion history, the age cross checks. So I think it's a strong theory. It is not wrong, and by Big Bang, I mean cosmic inflation. It is not wrong, it's incomplete. Cosmic inflation uh, gives us this beautiful picture where uh, the large-scale structure in the universe and the cosmic microwave background, basically everything we observe around us, is seeded from those primordial quantum fluctuations and how the whole universe started small and stretched all its uh, non-uniformities as, as uh, cosmic inflation made that universe to accelerate and grow big very quickly. So we have a set of observations. Our uh, precision cosmology is, is a very advanced field by now. So um, all our observations agree perfectly well with this picture of cosmic inflation. It does not mean they prove cosmic inflation. Um, it's uh, conceivable that someone else might come along with a different picture that also agrees with this set of observations. However, we are happy because here is a theory that tells us everything from the first fraction of a second to present day. And we know our universe started small and it's growing. But that picture does not tell us what gave that first energy and right. what was there before and what lies beyond. Our universe is uh, about 10 to the power 27 centimeters, the visible universe, and it's only 13.8 billion years old. These are big numbers, but, but they are not inconceivably big. So we, all of us have the right to ask what was there 13.9 billion years ago, <laughs> or what was there at uh, what's beyond 10 to the power 27 centimeters. The Big Bang was not the beginning, there was an eon prior to us, one before that, one before that, etc. There was supposed to be something within the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds. Now, what does that mean? You think of a number, one fraction, the bottom, the denominator, is a number which has 32 digits. And that fraction, ridiculously small fraction of a second, the universe was supposed to have expanded far more rapidly than anything that we're aware of now. It's called an exponential expansion, which is supposed to have taken place, and that's called inflation, and it is very much part of conventional cosmology. Now, to me, that's the weak point of conventional cosmology, because you, you have to introduce um, 
ideas which there's no other reason for, apart from making it do this. Um, but apart from that, if you go one blip after that, I completely agree with what Sean's saying. So the argument has to be from before that. And I'm claiming that although there was this idea of a steady state model, which I grew up with, I may say when I was in Cambridge as a graduate student, this was all going on, and Dennis Sharma, who was a good friend of mine, and Bondi and Gold and uh, <clears throat> people I used to know, Fred Hoyle, uh, and they were all dead keen on this idea that the universe went on expanding and expanding, and it didn't change much because new matter was created all the time. OK, I like that theory because philosophically it meant there was no beginning, and you could talk about the universe in that kind of way. Now, I'm picking up on that in a different way, though. I'm not disagreeing with the Big Bang. There was a Big Bang. I am rather disagreeing that quantum mechanics was important there, and that's a big point of difference, really. The reason that you're allowed to continue before the Big Bang, which is what I'm trying to claim, is because, in a certain sense, I'm agreeing with Sean, that you don't have time. How do we measure time? We have extraordinarily accurate clocks today because a particle of mass is really a clock. And this based on the two basic f most famous formulae of 20th century physics, namely Einstein's E equals mc squared, which tells you energy and mass are equivalent, and Max Planck's E equals h nu, or f, whatever you call it, which tells you that energy and frequency are equivalent. Put the two together, that tells you that mass and frequency are equivalent. That tells you that if you have a massive particle, it is a clock of extraordinary precision. Now, the point is when you don't have massive particles, and this would apply to the remote future, when basically the universe is dominated by photons running around either from stars or from black holes. You see, Stephen Hawking, his most famous discovery, if you like, or theoretical discovery, was that black holes are not completely black, or they're not completely cold, that they have a temperature. That temperature is so low that it's much lower than anything you could build in the lab, certainly with the big, biggest black holes. Our sun, our galaxy, has a black hole in its center, which is about four million times the mass of the sun. That's so cold that it puts everything else in the shade. One minute. One minute. <laughs> now, the thing is that according to Hawking, these things eventually will evaporate away because the universe gets colder than the black holes. They evaporate away and disappear. So when those have disappeared, there's nothing left but things which don't have any mass. There's the photons. Basically, that's true. And that they're the only way of... You don't have clocks anymore because you don't have mass. And so the remote future, you have no way of keeping time. And the idea is that this remote future where you have this expansion of the universe, which is becoming exponential expansion, which is what we currently observe, continues forever. Now, I found that a really depressing picture. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me, you know, the universe is pretty exciting now, but then you know, what you want, this eternity of boredom. But then I thought, who's going to be bored? Not, well, not us, because we won't be around. The main things that will be out there were photons. And it's very hard to bore a photon, I'll tell you. <laughs> because <laughs> photons, the main reason is probably they don't experience anything, but that's not the point. The main point is that they <coughs> don't measure time. Photons right up to infinity, and they're still there. And they say, what, what, what have we got to do with the universe? They're still there. The idea is that the universe continues with what I call another eon. Our eon started with the Big Bang and ends with this ex ex exponential expansion. You that the then up, Roger. becomes the Big Bang of another eon. And there was an eon before. Uh, I could go and talk for endlessly with this if you allow me. But, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I, but the I question can't. is the Big Bang was not the beginning. There was an eon prior to ours. One before that, one before that, etc. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at AI TV.